Well, good morning. He mentioned, uh, he asked me if I were nervous. You know like when you have little kids and they see a spider and they're like, oh no, and you're like, hey, that spider's way more afraid of you than you are of it. So this morning, I'm the spider. And you guys are the six-year-old running around trying to kill me. Uh, <laughs> Um, and so I, I consider this a great honor, not because of me, not for me, not me as a person, but because of what this is. This is a gathering of people that are trying to hear from God. This is a gathering of mostly believers, and if you're not a believer in here and somehow someone got you in here, I just want to say welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I hope during this time that you can hear from God, that you will see in the scripture the truth that God has for you. Uh, for the rest of us, those of us that call ourselves brothers and sisters, this is an honor because across the globe, other people do this along with us every single week. We gather together to build one another up, to spur one another on, to love and good deeds, to encourage one another. And man, we need encouragement. We need each other. And so I'm going to do something now. You're welcome to do it if you're physically able. No one be judging your neighbors if they don't do this. This is just, if you feel welcomed in your heart to do this, I'm going to kneel on my knees, and I would like to pray before we begin, and I just want to invite you guys to this, if you would like to kneel also at your chair. So I'm going to kneel. Father, thank you for loving us. Help us to love you. We kneel together to you, before you. We're not here to hear from me. We're here because we, we need your word. We need food, spiritual food. Some of, us, some of us are hurting in such a way that we are desperate for you to speak to our hearts. So I pray that you would have grace and mercy upon us. Open the eyes and ears of our hearts and speak to us now. Speak to us in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for doing that. I know that's not a norm, and this probably my rating just went down. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, I'm glad to kneel before God, and I was joking. I know that a lot of you are too. To kneel before God. This morning, we're going to look at Jesus' life, and we're going to look at prayer. If you saw in your worship folder on the front part, it says prayer, pouring out your heart to God or pouring out your heart to God. I don't know if any of you grammarians in here are judging me for that. So pouring out your heart to God. And at Grace Community Church, even though I'm a guest preacher or a guest speaker here, this church is all about building or developing biblically grounded followers of God. Biblically grounded, knowing what God has said so we can know him and love him and follow him and encourage others to follow him. And so that is what this church is about. That's why we meet every week. And so we're going to look at Jesus' life and we're going to look at his prayer. Because prayer is not simply a list, a list, a prayer list. Have anybody ever had a prayer list? You know, where you're like, okay, there's the prayer list. But prayer is not just that, is it? It's not just a list of requests. And it, it's also not just, oh, I'm about to take a test and I haven't studied. Please bless my grades. You know, it's not, it's not just, oh, I'm in my time and I forgot to do that. I don't know if you've ever walked home and you, or you got home, you walked to the door as a husband and a father and you felt so good and you walked through and everything's fine and then your wife looks at you and said, did you get it? What? what, what? And, and you, you just have that feeling of, I missed it. I missed it. You know, um, prayer is not just, Hurry up, help me right now in my time of need. Prayer is a relationship. It's a pouring out of your heart to God. The good times, the bad times, the small, the medium, the large. Prayer is not just simply talking to God. Although if you look up the definition of prayer, you will see talking to God, speaking to God. But we know as we look in scripture, as you view all the prayers in scripture, prayer is not simply just talking to God. It's pouring out your heart to him. And so we're going to look at how Jesus poured his heart out to God. And I'm going to ask some questions. And you Bible scholars and Christians for 30 years, I don't want you to judge me. I'm asking these questions. They're good questions. Some people have these questions. And so no elders get worried that I'm, I'm, I'm not going to know that Jesus is the Son of God. But I'm going to ask some questions as I read this. And I just want us to be there. 
I want you to be able to be in the garden with Jesus, watching him, watching him pray, sweating drops of blood, crying out to God. I want all of us to be able to hear and to feel and to see what God was doing. And so let's read in Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 44. I'm going to read one verse at a time. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about 33 years old. He's been mainly unpopular except when he was an infant. He was popular for a moment. And then he was mainly unpopular for about 30 years. And then at age, around age 30, he started his public ministry. And he has been preaching for three years, grabbing followers, getting people's attention, growing uh, in his, his popularity. And this is the end of the three years. This is the worst night of his entire life. This is where Jesus is going to get arrested. This is where the last weekend of Jesus' life, actually this is the last day technically of his, his life as a human on earth. This is the worst day of his entire life. And this is how he prayed to God. Verse 36, Then Jesus went with them to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, disciples or followers, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Why is Jesus so sorrowful and troubled? Why is he so bothered? Then verse 38, Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. This is not normal. My soul is sorrowful even to death. This is not, oh, I, I got to the end of my Netflix show and there's nothing else to watch. This is, this is, very, this is a once in a lifetime. Maybe, this is when you find out your kid has terminal cancer or you, someone you love is going to die or your spouse is dying or something's happening to you and, and you feel like your world's upside down. Your soul is very sorrowful even to the point of death. This is not a normal thing. This is not regular. This is very unique. This is a defining moment, some people call it. A defining moment in his life. My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed. Why would Jesus fall on his face? I know sometimes when I fall on my face, I know why, because I feel as if I'm a sinner. I want forgiveness. Have you ever felt so bad about your sin that you just, God, have you ever had to deal with anybody as bad as me? Has that thought ever entered your heart? Have you, you know, you hear, you hear the words on the cross, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, but not me. I know what I do. Where, where's my father forget? You know, I'm, I'm thinking, the, what, when I fall on my face, it's because I feel as if I'm a failure and I've sinned. But Jesus is not a sinner. The Bible says Jesus never, he never, he knew no sin. Jesus never sinned. So why would Jesus fall on his face? He, and he prayed, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, and this is verse 39, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Why did he say that? Did he think it was possible? Really think hard here. Did he think that it was possible that he would not have to endure the cross? If he did, why has he been preaching for a whole year telling people, they're going to hand me over, the Son of Man's going to die, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be handed over to the leaders, they're going to kill me, I'm going to die. Did he think it was possible that he would get out of that? And if he didn't think it was possible, it's a good answer. If he didn't think it was possible, then why say it? Why say it if you don't think it's possible? God turned me into a butterfly. Why would anybody say it if it's possible? No one would say that. Why would Jesus say it if it weren't possible? If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What's the cup? Now, obviously, it's not a literal cup. The cup of wrath, the cup of suffering, the pain he was about to go through. Jesus was about to go through the worst night of his entire life and... His own father was going to crush him. I remember one time I was talking to Samuel. Samuel's here this morning. 
is my six-year-old. And I was telling him about Jesus on the cross. And I told him this verse, Isaiah 53, 10, about God, it pleased him to crush him. And he said, so, so why did God have to smash Jesus on the cross? Jesus is about to go through. He's already going through. He's already being troubled and sorrowful. The worst night of his life. So what is the cup? Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Or not as I desire, but as you desire. Not as I want, but as you want. Now, doesn't this sound a little awkward that Jesus would say, have you ever prayed this way, by the way? Have you ever prayed this way? Don't let my desire be the answer to my prayer. Have you ever prayed that way? Don't let my desire be the answer to my prayer. Isn't that just odd? This is such a weird, unique moment. One where God could speak to our hearts. Where I pray, and I've been hoping for a long time that God would, His Word would speak through His Word to your hearts that you would know how to pour out your heart to God. God wants that with you. Well, why did Jesus pray in this way? If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Verse 40. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. No question there. And you, you're guilty. You're guilty too. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? I just imagine if I was having the worst night of my life, and let's say Dave becomes my new best friend, and I call up Pastor Dave and I say, Dave, the worst night of my entire life, my soul is sorrowful even to death. And he came to my house and he picked me up and we're sitting in his truck and I'm telling him about what's going on. Please, watch with me and pray. And I, all I hear is... <sighs> and I look over in the driver's seat and there's Pastor Dave sleeping in the car. I would, you couldn't wait one hour to go to sleep. You know, if, if you told your closest friends, this is the worst night of my life. Watch with me and pray. You can see what Jesus was feeling. Maybe he's feeling alone, grieved, sorrowful. Even his closest friends weren't there for him. Could you not wait? Or could you not watch with me one hour? Verse 41. Watch and pray that. That word that is really important in the Bible. That. This is like a purpose, a clause, a because. That, there's a reason why I'm telling you this. Here's the explanation. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Was Jesus just talking about them? Was his spirit willing, but his flesh was weak? Was he just telling them to watch and pray, but was he not doing it himself? Watch and pray. Verse 42. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Why did he pray a second time? And, and, and why did he say it just a little bit differently this time? Verse 43. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, like some of you. He found them sleeping. No, I'm just kidding. You're, you're not sleeping. But he found that it's the middle of the night. Of course they're tired. And he finds them sleeping. Verse 44. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Why would you ever repeat your prayer? Did Jesus feel like God didn't hear him the first time? Or if by his many words he would be heard? Well, we know that's not true because in Matthew 6 it tells us, they think it's because of their many words. It's not the amount of words. It's not for convincing or informing. Why would Jesus pray the same thing again that third time? Why would his heart be so full after he just poured it out a first and second time? Why would he have to pour that out again? Why would he repeat himself? I think we can learn a few things from this passage and I know we can learn way more. So we don't have time for me to tell you all that. I would love, I could talk about this passage forever. I still, after studying this, I still am amazed at this night. This, this just, this couple of hours of Jesus in the garden. I still have questions. But I think there's at least four pairs 
of things that we can learn from here, just observations. And so if you take notes, I know you got a big blank spot. Hopefully that doesn't stay blank. I want to talk about from the passage, how does the passage, how does this event in Jesus' life teach us how to pour out our hearts to God? What are some things that Jesus did that could teach us how to pour our hearts out to God? So number one, I think we can pray oftenly and privately. Pray often and privately. In verse 36, it says, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit there while I go over there and pray. Jesus was having the worst day of his entire life, and get this, he didn't have to do anything different than what he had been doing his entire life. Jesus had a habit of praying. He had a habit of going away, getting to a private place, and pouring out his heart to God. So let's examine his life just for a moment. Let's look at some verses and make sure we're on the right path. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, this is Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. There's a lot there, but the secret part is what we're talking about. Jesus taught and did himself, he did this, where he would go off in secret, in private, in prayer. So think about this for yourself. If you were to give yourself a percentage, a measurement, how often has your prayer this past week been in public and how much of it has been privately? Is it 50% and 50%? Think about all the times you've prayed this week, maybe at the dinner table, maybe before a Bible study or life group or coming to church or going to bed. How much of your prayer has been private and how much of your prayer has been public? Most of the prayer commands in the scripture are private. They're pri- pray privately. Go to, your, go to a secret place, a private secluded place. Pray often and pray privately. Jesus taught this and he did it. Matthew chapter 14, verse 23. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. By himself to pray. Jesus did this often. It was his custom, his habit. He would often go away to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. You can't have distractions in your life and be able to pray and pour out your heart, right? Just imagine if you're at a restaurant and you're sitting in a seat and you're trying to talk to a friend and then somebody sits right next to you and you're talking about some pretty sensitive things. What do you do? You kind of quiet down and you get a little closer and you kind of lean in and you don't want everybody in Newton knowing what's going on. So you get quiet. You're at Brahms. You get, you know, you, you don't want everybody to know. Distractions will keep you from being able to pour out your heart. That's why you have to pray privately. You have to go in private and pray. The phone, your kids, if you've got young kids, hey, I've got young kids and a wife. The wife doesn't make anything not easy. The kids, their their work. And so I've got kids. It takes a lot of effort for me to wake up early and to go to bed early to pray because I have to get up before my family gets up to pray. I'll be distracted. So... You need two things. You need a time and a place. You need time and privacy. Go find a place to pray privately. That's going to be one of the ways that you'll be able to pour out your heart to God. Mark chapter 1 verse 35. And rising very early in the morning, and I know some of us are late people, and you night owls, you're like Jesus too. If you can find a place, Jesus also at night, prayed all night one time, find a time and a place. If this is not a habit in your life now, it will not be a habit in your life on the worst day of your life. You will not turn to God in your time of grief if you're not used to turning to God. So keep that, you know, take that to heart. Rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, desolate, private, alone, isolated, and there he prayed. Luke chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. But now even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Luke chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. Jesus made it a habit, a regular occurrence. What are habits? Those things that you do over and over, no matter what. They kind of make up who you are. If I were to ask you, what kind of person you are? At four o'clock, when you ask me a billion questions and you try to stump me with your questions. If I were to ask you a question, tell me about yourself. I want to know about you. Most of your answers would be your habits. 
where you go to work, where you go to school, your family, who you see on a regular basis. A lot of who you are as a person are built into your habits. Make a habit to go to a private place and pray. Not pray as in just listing a list of prayers, but pouring out your heart to God. So make it a habit. Jesus had a habit of praying to God. And this prepared him for this night. He was able to pour out his heart because he had been doing this his entire life. Number two, pray with humility and honesty. Look at verses in Matthew chapter 26, verses 37 to 39 again. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. It's hard to be honest because what happens when you're honest and you start opening up? The feelings come. Sometimes you just want to get away. And I I think there's a time for rest. I think if you've been through a very difficult situation, there is a moment where you've got to get out of the weeds, you've got to get out of the muck, you've got to get out of the mud. You, You need rest sometimes. But you don't need rest all the time. It takes work to be honest and to open up to God, to pour out your heart to him. When Jesus took Peter and James and John, that's when he began to be sorrowful and troubled. That process began as he was going to his place of prayer. When he was ready to open up his heart, that's when the feelings came and he didn't stop there. He didn't let the bad feelings and the, and the mess and the junk that was, that was and I, I, this is very hard to talk about Jesus this way. I'm just talking about his humanity in a non-sinful way. Jesus was hungry and thirsty and tired and weak and that's why he fell on his face. As a human, that's what he did with flesh, but he's still God. He never, didn't, he never wasn't God. He was always God. He was just God put on flesh. And he had that weak flesh that made him tempted to to sleep and to get away and to call angels down from heaven. But he did not do that. We have flesh that as soon as we start to open up is going to try to pull us away from that. So pray with humility and honesty and see how honesty is hard. It can keep you from being open to God. He began to be sorrowful and troubled, verse 37. That's when the process happened. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here, with, remain here and watch with me. Some people don't want to open up their heart because of the pain that they feel and they're afraid. I don't want to be honest with God and tell him that I'm angry at him for, for giving them cancer, for giving them a terminal, ter, terminal sickness, for... For, for taking my kids away, for, for moving my kids away, for taking my job, for, for, for whatever is going on in your life. I don't want to admit to God that it makes me angry and I don't understand why he's doing this to me, why he's letting this happen. And we're afraid to be honest with God, but you've got to be honest with God. And this is a whole different sermon, but if you were to read the Psalms in the Old Testament, you would get a lot of heartfelt pouring out of your heart to God in those songs. God wants you to be honest with him, even though it is hard. Sometimes people feel like they can't. So I asked some friends. I asked some friends, why is it difficult to open up to God? And I just want to share. This is just their testimony. This is not scripture. This is not the word of God. This isn't what we live and breathe and die on. But here's some testimony from some real friends of mine that were willing to let me share this. Heather said this about how hard it is to open up to God, to pour out her heart to God. Sometimes I just don't feel worthy of his time and effort. I fall short a lot of the time, so who am I to complain to him? Candace said, I often knew what I had done or was doing was wrong, and I didn't feel right coming to God for advice or help. Natasha, she's a close friend of mine, such a sweet young lady, she says, I think over the years when I've prayed for something, for what seems like an eternity, no amens there, but okay, that's fine. I'll be honest. You guys just don't say amen. I think over the years when I've prayed for something for I want, for what seems like an eternity, and I don't hear an answer, or I don't see God move, and I get frustrated, and I think, why keep praying about the same thing over and over again? I believe God hears me, But when he doesn't move in my timing, the thoughts creep in. Thoughts creep in that he must not care about me or he must not care about the situation. 
I feel like I sound like a broken record and I start to get on my own nerves. She's such an honest, sweet lady. You'd love Natasha. Aaron says this. Now, Aaron's a rougher guy, tattoos, been away from God most of his life. Just recently became a Christian not too long ago. Such a sweet, sweet brother of mine. I love Aaron so much. I'm going to miss him if I end up moving here. Uh, and I know that, you know, that's up to God. That's God's will. But Aaron's been far away from God for a long time. He said this. I just didn't think he cared. I couldn't see him working in my life. I didn't know how to have a relationship with him. I wonder how many people in this room feel that way. I know you wouldn't want to admit it. It's hard to admit it, especially at church. It's hard to admit it at church. We sing and we love God and we feel his presence here. And then there's that temptation that we don't want to talk or think about when his presence doesn't feel like it's in our lives. It's hard to be honest and to open up. Maybe you're like Aaron and you feel like, I wouldn't know how to trust God if he came and walked up to me right now. I've got a trail of broken relationships behind me. I don't know if I've ever been able to trust anybody in my entire life. Maybe you've got brokenness when it comes to trust in your life and you think, I don't want to open up to God. I just don't know how. Pamela says this. She's a very nice lady, but a lady, and you'll get that in a minute. When I don't open up to God, it's because it feels more immediately gratifying to self-medicate my pain away. It's ridiculous when I think about it, but I regularly turn to cupcakes, sleep, Netflix, or girlfriends before I turn to the one and only one who can be my true source of comfort. I mentioned she was a woman because I actually told her, I said, I feel the same way except for the girlfriends. I never turn to girlfriends. <laughs> I've turned to cupcakes a few times. I've turned to entertainment a time or two, but I've never turned to girlfriends. <laughs> Stephanie says this, I will pray and pray and not feel that he hears me. So I'll just give up and sometimes turn to worldly coworkers and family, people that are not believers. Man, that's tempting. If you work, if you work with non-believers, I know Pastor Dave doesn't work with, at least I hope he doesn't work with any non-believers. But if you work with non-believers, it's tough because you, you get their input in it and their input sounds good. It sounds nice. It's tempting. Sometimes you want to believe what people that aren't headed in the same direction. You want to believe what they're saying. But pray with humility and honesty. In order to pour out your heart to God, you've got to be honest and you've got to be humble. And humble doesn't mean it's because you sinned because Jesus humbled himself and he didn't sin. Humble means you come to God empty-handed. I need you. Jesus in that moment fell on his face on the ground and that was his way of saying, I can do nothing without you. I do only what the Father tells me. I do only what I see the Father doing. I only do what he says. Jesus repeated this multiple times in his ministry and it confuses us sometimes because we know Jesus is God. But why does Jesus just submit himself to God when he's a human here on earth with his humanity? To show you, to, to relate to you. Uh, Kyle mentioned this before out of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter two at the end and Hebrews chapter four. Jesus endured. He, he can sympathize with our weaknesses because he was tested in every way that we're te tested. He was tempted in every way that you were tempted. He knows what it's like to be drawn away from God's direction. Jesus humbled himself because he needed God and so do we. Not answers, not escape, but God. God may not answer me today, but I need him. He may not relieve the pain today, but I need him. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7 says this, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Think about that. Don't let that, don't read over that so quickly. God as a man, become a man, put on flesh, cried out with tears and supplication, cried out to God. Don't just gloss over that. Oh, that's Jesus. Oh, that's just Jesus. Oh, he already knew. Don't let that pass over you. Don't belittle what he suffered in his humanity. Don't think light of what he endured. He endured more than we ever have because he never gave in. He never sinned. We have sinned. We've given in. We've thrown in the towel. He never did. 
He knows more about the weight of sin than any of us could ever imagine. When he was on earth, he cried out to God, sweating drops of blood. There's another place in Hebrews that says, none of us has suffered to the point of shedding blood. I think that's talking about Jesus in the garden. Jesus humbled himself because he needed God, and we do too. If you want to be able to pour out your heart to God, you've got to humble yourself. Remember who you're talking to. You could be raw, you could be genuine, you could be, you could be open and transparent. But don't turn on him, turn to him. With loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. He was heard because of his piety. He was heard because of the humble state that he was in. Jesus was heard by God the Father, even though God the Father didn't do what any of us would want to do. He turned to God instead of turning away from him. Number three, pray in faith and submission. If you look at verse 39, the second part, Jesus says, if it be possible, my father, if it be possible. By the way, he said my father and not our father. Normally in the book of Matthew, he, he says our father. He even teaches the, the, his disciples to pray our father. But here is personal, my father, the father of me. He does it in the vocative to where he's just saying, addressing God, just saying father, The father of me, my father, he calls him. If it be possible. Why did Jesus pray in the realm of possibilities? Does praying in faith mean that you have to believe with all your might that you're going to get exactly what you desire? And I've heard this. This is popular in Christian circles and churches. What does it mean to pray in faith? Does it mean God's going to give me what 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 I'm asking for? I got to muster up as much strength as I can. I got to believe it. Believe, believe. It's almost like the the train that went up the hill. I think I can. I think I can. The little engine that could. Maybe couldn't at first, but he could. Is that what praying in faith really means? You've got to really believe God's going to give you exactly what he wants. If that's true, Jesus did not pray in faith. So we know that can't mean what what it means to pray in faith. Praying in faith does not mean you trust that God's going to do what you want. It means that you trust God. It doesn't mean that you're sure of the outcome. It means that you're sure of God. It doesn't mean that you're certain you know what's going to happen if you pray or that God's going to do a certain thing. You're not certain of the end. You're just certain of God. And Jesus, he exampled that for us. He prayed in faith. He trusted in God if it's possible. And faith and submission go together. He prayed in faith and submission. Submission means you're giving over your will, your desire, your wants. Can God deliver him? Of course he can. Does he care? Of course he does. Will he answer in time? I actually had a conversation with a friend of mine a week ago, and he was real anxious about something, and I could relate to him. I won't tell you what situation in my life I was super anxious about that was coming up just recent, you know, soon later. But last week I was talking to him, and I was telling him, I was telling them, listen, what does it mean when we pray anxiously and we don't know what's going to happen and it bothers us and it keeps us up? Sometimes it means that we either don't trust that God's going to answer or that he's not going to answer in time. And that's not faith. That's not faith. Pray in faith does not mean you know exactly what's going to happen. But it also doesn't mean that you just don't know anything. You have a surety, an assurance, a, a certainty, this faith, this trust, this, your eyes are looking forward. You believe in God. I don't know what he's going to put me through, but I trust him. I don't know what he's going to, I don't know what he's going to, what pain he's going to let me endure, but I trust him. Pray in faith and submission. They go hand in hand because once you trust him, you're going to submit to him. You're going to decide whatever he wants. You know, the second and third time that Jesus prayed, he, the first time he prayed, if it's possible. The second time he prayed, if it's not possible. Do you see the subtle change in his heart to where God started giving him some direction? To where he was praying, hey, if this is possible, please, please, please. Not exactly like that. But then it's, if it's not possible. Have you ever prayed for something and God didn't give it to you and you started to change your prayer? Not of a lack of faith, but almost of a submission of the will. You know what? If it's not possible for this to pass, 
If it's not possible for her or him to live, if it's not possible for you to heal him or her, if it's not possible for you to take this pain away, don't let my desire be the answer of my prayer. Let your desire. Submit to God's will. Submit to his desire, to submit to his wants. Pouring out your heart means that you're asking God to pour his heart back into you. You're emptying out your heart in prayer so that God will give you his direction and strength. And that's what he did. If you look at uh, the end of it, in verses 41 through 44, pray for direction and strength. That's what Jesus did. When he poured out his heart to God, he was emptying his heart of his desire and he was asking God the Father to put God's desire in him. Pray for direction and strength. Number four, these are the last pair. In Luke, in Matthew chapter 26, verses 41 through 44, I'm going to read it. Watch and pray that you, that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Remember, I don't think he's just talking about them. He's talking about himself. The spirit and the flesh, two different things. That you may not enter into temptation. He was tempted. Think of, think of temptation as a direction away from God. If you want to boil it down to the simplest part, temptation is just direction away from God. It's not what God wants. It's not, it's not what God desires. It's not what God's asking you to do. Temptation pulls you away from God. Whatever he wants you to do or whatever he wants you not to do, temptation pulls you away. So think of temptation as the wrong direction. Jesus told his disciples, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. You need direction and you need strength. Indeed, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Your body doesn't want to go to bed early so you can wake up early to pray. I can tell you, my body wants more ice cream every time I'm somewhere where there's ice cream. Always. I, I just admit it. Like, you know, as a pastor, it's easy for me to admit my sin because everybody's kind of shocked by it, which I think is funny. Every time I have more food than I need, my heart is tempted to gluttony. Every time. Me and food, rough relationship. Every time I have more money than I think I need, my heart is tempted, directed toward greed. Every time I have more time than I think I need, I'm tempted to laziness. I am always drawn, tempted away from God and I need to be sober for the sake of my prayers, as Peter said. I need to watch and pray so that I may not be tempted, so that I might not enter temptation, so I might not be led away in the wrong direction. Pray for direction and strength. We're going to look at some supporting verses to this because I want you to ask yourself this question. What did Jesus do after he got away and got alone to pray? What happened? What did he say or not say? What did he do or not do? Let's just observe. Let's look at it. What happened with Jesus when he, went, when he got alone to pray? We'll start with Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 38. This is where Jesus preaches in Galilee. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, overachiever, right? Overachiever. I was kidding. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon, that's Peter, and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. I can just imagine. i I'm not trying to add to scripture at all. I'm just, I'm just talking about it, thinking about it. I can just imagine his buddies come up. He just picked them not too long ago. And they're like, hey, everyone's looking for you. And why didn't you tell us? Aren't we your buddies? We look like a fool. We don't know where you are. I bet they were blaming him. I don't know exactly what they're doing. I don't want to try to add to scripture. But it's clear here that they were upset with him. Where are you? Everyone's looking for you. So Jesus was alone and praying. And he said to them, he was such a, mental ninja. He was so cool with it. He always knew what to say. Let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. That, that is why I came out. He had a sense of direction after he would go off alone to pray. He knew what his next steps were. He knew what God wanted him to do. He would go alone and pour out his heart to God and God would put his direction and his strength back into him. And he knew to where when his buddies, who's trying to manhandle him, I think a little bit, hey, everyone's looking for you. This is where we are. You're, how are you, you're not going to get a following this way, leaving us, not telling us what's going on. He tells them, 
hey, we've got to leave. We've got to go on to the next town. I know why I came. I came to preach, and I need to go to the other towns and preach. He wasn't led astray because he received direction from God. Pray for direction and strength. Luke 4, verses 42 through 43, this is the parallel passage. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. Desolate means isolated, private, alone. Uh, Heston. No, I'm just kidding. I was joking. I have never even been to Heston. It's a joke because someone here is, likes Heston. Anyway, I'm, I'm ruining this. I'm, ru- I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I ruined it. So he goes to a desolate place, not, not anywhere near here. And the, and the people, <laughs> I don't know why I said that. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. Any preacher would do this. Oh, you love me? Everyone in this town loves me? I got to go, right? Everybody would do that. He knew. He had a strength and a direction from God. He knew what God was telling him to do. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. Luke chapter 6, 12 through 13. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. Now, we know it wasn't a list because that would have lasted about six minutes. Praying is not just, here's what I want. Or here's what is on this piece of paper. Prayer is pouring out your heart to God. Everything. What's going on? Your thoughts. Your questions. Your doubts. Your what you think God's telling you to do. Say it back to God. Say, I think you want me to do this. I think you're calling me to go here. I think you want me to pour out your heart to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. Jesus, on the night when he was getting ready to pick the ten disciples, there's a huge deal. He knew it was coming. He spent all night in prayer. Direction. He wanted God's direction. He wanted God to fill his spirit to where he knew what God wanted for him. Which disciples to choose. Pray for direction and strength. And Luke chapter 22, verses 41 through 43. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. Now if you notice, this is the same passage as Matthew chapter 26. It's just in Luke's gospel. So this is the same night. This is the same story. But this is Luke's account. So this is Luke's, you know, this is from Luke. And when he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Not what I want, but what you want. And there he appeared to him, an, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. So it doesn't include this in Matthew, and I don't know why. Maybe because Matthew was written to the Jews and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and had all these arguments about angels and after death and all this kind of stuff. I don't know why. But God still told us, and he told us, and he let us know in Luke chapter 22, an angel, God sent an angel to come down and strengthen Jesus in this night. Jesus prayed for God's direction and strength. He poured out his heart so that God would pour God's heart back into him. And I know Jesus is God. Jesus is every bit God, 100%. Jesus is God. I'm not saying he's not God. We're just looking at the humanity of Jesus, what Jesus did when he was here 2,000 years ago. He poured out his heart so God would pour his heart back into him. So here's an illustration that I think a lot of you, it would be helpful if you did this. I imagine not everybody's going to do this, and that's fine. But here's something you could do at home. Get two cups, styrofoam cups, plastic cups, whatever. Get two cups, and on one cup, with permanent mark or something, write my heart. On the other cup, write God or God's heart. So you have two cups, my heart, God's heart, okay? Uh, and then fill up my heart, the my heart cup, with some tap water. Now, if you want to save yourself some money and you live in Newton, just find any jewelry or precious metals laying around, melt that down, <laughs> pour that into the my, my heart cup. But either way, fill up the my heart cup with water or precious jewelry. And then leave the God's heart cup empty. And in the morning, put it somewhere, wherever this desolate, isolated, private place is going to be. Fill it up with water in the morning. Put it there and pray to God as you read scripture, as you read. And even if you don't understand anything you're reading, say, God, I don't understand anything that's going on. You're just looking at the Bible. You're just reading it. You're just trying to get it in you. You're just trying to get there. You're just trying to read it. At the end, after you're done reading or in reading or maybe before reading, I like doing it after Pour out your heart to God. And then as you look at the two cups, ask yourself this question. Am I really pouring out everything? 
and pour out water. And I don't know how to measure this. I don't know how this is going to work for some of you, but just do it. And if you feel a conviction like, I can't pour it all out, ask yourself, what is it? What is it that I'm not unleashing? What is it that I'm not pouring out? What, what am I not saying to him? What am I not being honest about? What am I not being open with? And pour that cup into God's heart. And know this, when you pray, when you pour your heart out to God, he gives you direction and strength. God loves you. God, God says, I promise to be with you. If you believe in him, if you believe in Jesus, you know what Jesus has been through. You know what Jesus endured. There is no pain in your life. There is no grief. There is no sorrow. There is no worst night of my life or the dark night of the soul. There is nothing like this that in your life that Jesus hasn't endured. Pour out your heart to him. And God promises that when you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. And God keeps his promises. Because if there was ever a night when God would not have kept his promise, if there was ever a moment in the history of mankind where God would say, I changed my mind, if there was ever a time where you would even wrongly put God on trial, even though we should not do that, but if you were to try to say, would God do what he says he promises he can do, he will do, you can have faith from this passage because if you have kids or grandkids and your kid or grandkid came to you and was crying and saying, please let this cup pass from me. Don't make me endure this pain. Don't make me go through this. Please don't let her die. Please don't let him die. Please don't let this go through. Please don't turn my world up. Please answer me. If, there was a, if, if you had a child or a grandchild that came to you and said, said that, would you not in that moment do everything you possibly could to rescue them from that pain? To take them out of that, to, to deliver them from suffering. God the Father did not do that for Jesus. And that is a huge exclamation point in the Bible of him saying, I keep my promises. I said that I would send a savior. I said that I would send a deliverer to you. I told you that you cannot forgive yourself and I will send my son and he will live perfectly and you will murder him and he will die. But on the third day, he's going to raise again. On the third day, he's going to come back. I promise you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. Why would I tell you if I'm not going to do it? If there's ever a time for you to question God's promises, here is a good time where you would think he would change, and he doesn't. God keeps his promises. Pour out your heart to him. Pray for strength and direction. Go to God. Don't turn away from him. So Kyle's going to lead us in worship. We're going to pray. I'm going to get off the stage. I'm going to come down here. And I, I just want this to be a time of prayer. If you want to pour your heart out to God, maybe if you want to come pray with somebody. Kyle said that there's pastors, elders, people here that would pray. If you want to pray with somebody, go ahead and do that, please. Don't leave out of here. This may be the most important part of the entire service for some of you. This is the response time. This is where you have a moment to not just forget everything and walk out the door, but you can turn to God and say, I don't pour my heart out to you. I haven't wanted to be honest with you about this thing that's going on. I am angry that you would let me endure this suffering. Pour your heart out to God. And let's use this time right now.